In the early 1960s, the Berlin Wall separates families, friends, and lovers. For Wolfgang Fuchs, Cold War politics were about to become fiercely personal. Wolfgang Fuchs and his fiancée Selina were typical young Berliners. Wolfgang lived in West Berlin, where he attended the university. Selina lived in the East. Like many young couples, they had to plan their future around a country divided by Cold War politics. In 1952, East Germany had officially closed the borders. The communists ruled the East, while the West was democratic. Still, travel remained unrestricted. Wolfgang and Selina, along with many Berliners, commuted across the border daily. Appearing. But as democratic West Germany prospered, Communist East Germany suffered shortages. The consequences were inevitable. Throughout 1960, 200,000 East Germans defected to the West. The East German government knew they had to act, and act fast. Continued defections would devastate an already depressed economy. Maria Noki, a former resident of East Germany, now works for the documentation center for the Berlin Wall. It was very evident that something had to be done to stop the escapes from East Germany. The escapees were young people, well-educated people. East Germany was losing its best citizens. It became clear in 1961 that the government had to stop this exodus. The government solution would shock the entire world. On the night of Saturday, August 13, 1961, Soviet and East German troops began sealing the 25-mile border between East and West Berlin. Like everyone else in Berlin that Sunday, Selina awoke to terrifying news. According to news reports on the radio, travel between East and West Germany was now blocked. She tried to call Wolfgang in West Berlin, but the lines were dead. Klaus Klein remembers hearing the news. It didn't seem like a big problem. I thought we could get on the train, pull the emergency brake in West Berlin, and jump out. But it became clear when I learned the train doesn't even go into West Berlin anymore. The East Germans had blocked all train travel and the 95 streets connecting the two parts of the city. Wolfgang Fuchs and Selina were now separated by armed guards and barbed wire. He knew he had to move quickly if he was to rescue Selina. In the early days, the borders weren't thoroughly protected. With Wolfgang's help, she slipped through the wire to freedom. Others were not as lucky. 
the border became more dangerous. Still, the escape attempts continued. Hagen Kosh guarded the border in East Germany in 1961. People simply crossed the border by the hundreds because they knew ways through backyards and fields that couldn't be observed. Orders were given to block these above-ground paths with larger obstacles. Slowly but surely, concrete blocks replaced the barbed wire. Within a few weeks, it became painfully clear that the Berlin Wall was there to stay. Eva Klein, a citizen of East Germany, was concerned. No one knew the wall was going to be built. We thought, after the flood of refugees quieted down, they would take the wall back down again. The city was ringed by barbed wire and guarded by East German soldiers. Wolfgang Fuchs had managed to rescue Selina, but he still had fellow students and friends trapped on the other side of the wall. He became a man with a mission. He was desperate to get all the people he knew out of East Berlin. But crossing the border had become a nightmare. German troops were ordered to shoot anyone who tried to defend. Within weeks, a dozen people were killed as they attempted to flee to the west. People decided that it was no longer possible above ground. Death was too great a risk. So they sought other ways, other alternatives. The deaths frightened everyone, but it hardened the resolve of men like Wolfgang Fuchs and his friend Wolfgang Cockrow. Cockrow shared Fuchs' hatred of oppression. I was so full of zorn and so full of abwehr gegenüber diesem system. We hated the communist system. The wall just confirmed that 17 million people were living in an internment camp. They couldn't laugh at the wrong place or at the wrong time. They couldn't trust anyone, and they couldn't say what they wanted. Fuchs and his friends were desperate to get everyone they knew out of East Germany, and quickly. The wall was becoming better fortified by the day. Climbing over the wall was now impossible. Fuchs and his colleagues discussed going under it instead. They studied the sewer tunnels that crossed the border. But the East Germans had already sealed them. And there it was at that time, in 1962, that younger people, students, started looking for other ways across. They came up with the idea of digging tunnels. Tunneling under the wall was a bold but dangerous plan. The risk of discovery was huge. East German spies were everywhere. They prowled West Berlin, listening for conspiracy plans. Fuchs and his team dug a 30-meter tunnel from a basement in West Berlin to a building on the other side of the wall.
Once the tunnel was declared safe, Fuchs began bringing people through. Come in. Here. They were ecstatic. But success was all too brief. The East Germans discovered the tunnel and destroyed it. They had successfully stopped the influx of defectors through the tunnel. But they had not stopped the man who built it, Wolfgang Fuchs. In the early 1960s, brave West Germans were willing to risk everything to bring their friends and family to freedom. Wolfgang Fuchs' first tunnel had been discovered and destroyed. But by late 1963, he had already planned his second. Fuchs located a vacant bakery slated for demolition. Secrecy was essential. East German guards watched for signs of escape. Discovery meant imprisonment or death. Posing as a photographer, he struck a deal with the building owner. He rented the basement as a dark room. The bakery was in full view of the East Berlin watchtowers. Fuchs and his men would have to keep a low profile. The tunnel diggers would live in the basement for the duration of the mission. Fuchs also made certain that everyone who worked on the tunnel had friends or family in the East. That way, no one would inform on them. With his security in place, Fuchs now faced the sheer physical challenge of the task ahead. The no man's zone around the wall had been widened. They would have to dig a tunnel 145 meters long to reach an abandoned building in East Berlin. That was five times as long as yeah. Fuchs' first tunnel. Once they broke through, he intended to smuggle 120 people out of East Berlin in three nights. Excavation would take months. The mountain of dirt had to be kept in the bakery to avoid detection. It would eventually fill the entire basement and part of the first floor. You have to imagine what was involved in digging a tunnel 12 meters deep through old Berlin. There were old sewage systems, old electrical cables, foundation wires. It was difficult work. The heroic mission was delayed by problems. The sandy soil wouldn't support a long tunnel. It was an unstable, claustrophobic shaft with no room to turn around. They needed lumber to shore up the walls and ceiling. It was smuggled in under the noses of the East German guards. Bucket by bucket, week after week, 30 volunteers worked in shifts around the clock. Supplies and food were financed by private citizens and anti-communist organizations. And, um, yeah, also they have really 
They had to do this under extreme secrecy. Wolfgang Fuchs wife, Selina, brought food and supplies to the tunnel. She always arrived with a man, acting like a pair of lovers so they wouldn't be noticed. As the tunnel grew deeper, so did the danger. Ventilation and artificial lights had to be brought in for the workers. The air underneath was so thin that it would extinguish your cigarette. You couldn't afford any equipment. An exhaust system had to be made from scratch. People worked in eight-day shifts in the grime. They dug for five months. Only a few meters away, East German guards watched for signs of escape. So far, Fuchs had been lucky. His tunnel was holding up. The tunnel now stretched to over 100 meters. But the work seemed never ending. Then a digger hit a drain pipe with his shovel. They had finally reached their target in East Berlin. From here, they would simply follow the pipe to the surface. The crew was elated. Still, they knew their job was only half over. The real danger lay ahead. The most dangerous time for them was the opening of the tunnel on the east side. Because they never knew if the state security service was informed about the existence of this tunnel and whether the Stasi were awaiting them in the basement to arrest them. On October 2nd, Fuchs used a dummy to see if East German rifles awaited him on the other side. We had broken through into this old, closed-up outhouse. The tunnel was opened on October 2nd. It's difficult to describe the tension we felt when we reached the end of the tunnel. Once they determined the coast was clear, the team embarked on an awesome task. Fuchs and his diggers had already compiled a list of friends and loved ones they intended to liberate from East Germany. On October 3rd, the first refugee received a telegram. It contained coded directions. As instructed, he went to the train station and studied the timetable. A stranger arrived and pointed to the name of a city mentioned in the telegram. The refugee responded with a prearranged password. He was then led to the building that hid the mouth of the tunnel. The password was his ticket inside. Tokyo. last possible moment, the team revealed the tunnel itself. The refugee slipped away to a new life in the West.
28 East Berliners escaped through the tunnel the night of October 3rd, 1964. The next night, more would come, including 32-year-old Klaus Klein, his wife, and their three-year-old child. By what method we would be led to the West, I did not know. I have to admit I hoped secretly that we would be given a false passport and allowed to just walk through the border. But I had no idea that it would be a tunnel. It would take the refugees between 10 and 30 minutes to crawl through the dark, wet passage. But West Berlin and hope lay on the other side. I kept on crawling, but was very afraid. It was terribly difficult to crawl through this tunnel because everywhere there were things which people had taken along. In their fear, they did want to take some things with them, but dropped them on the way. And we had to crawl over all of these things. Once they reached the west, the refugees were cleaned up. They had to be presentable on the street. When they left the bakery, they emerged as free Germans. There was crying and hugging. There was an indescribable feeling of happiness and joy. People were hugging each other. Some of the people were relatives that had not seen each other for a very long time. Over the next 48 hours, 23 men 31 women and three children crawled to their freedom on their bellies. But Wolfgang Fuchs knew that with each person who disappeared from East Germany, the danger of discovery skyrocketed. It had taken six long months, but Wolfgang Fuchs had realized his dream of building a tunnel to freedom. On October 5th, that dream would turn into a nightmare. Late that night, two nervous strangers approached the gate. They claimed they wanted to defect, but they didn't know the password. The gatekeeper mistook their nervousness for sincerity and admitted them. Suddenly, one of the men said he wanted to go get a friend who had lost his nerve. Both strangers excused themselves and left. The gatekeeper let them leave. From his observation post on a nearby rooftop, Wolfgang Fuchs spotted trouble. The two strangers had returned. They were accompanied by East German border guards armed with submachine guns. Frantic, Fuchs tried to warn his friends of the approaching danger, but his radio failed. The East Germans went straight to the building that housed the entrance to the tunnel. One of Fuchs' men fired a warning shot. In the firefight that ensued, Egon Schultz, an East German soldier, was killed. It was always claimed in the East that this Egon Schultz, this border soldier, was killed by criminal West Berliner slave traders. That was the spin. Documents released more than 25 years later revealed that Schultz was killed accidentally by the other border guard submachine gun. The tunnel was destroyed by East German authorities. In West Berlin, it earned the nickname Tunnel 57 for the 57 who dared to make the journey. In its two days of operation, it was the most successful escape route of its kind. Wolfgang Fuchs continued to help people escape until the early 1970s. He lived under the constant threat of capture until the wall came down in 1989. 
he now enjoys a quiet life. His courage helped reunite hundreds of friends and family separated by the Berlin Wall.